here, you're banging on it. No, no that was the other one. The other one. That's what she said. Right <laughs> 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 Alright, so we have Mary Minster Dean. Invitation. That's why I went to look for him. That mic didn't work. <laughs> Could be. Maybe. Got it. Yay! Maybe it just like some better. We wanted to embarrass Ken, the drunk wife. <coughs> we don't care. Embarrassing Ken is an easy, not an easy thing to do. He doesn't give a shit. <laughs> there you go. Have it. It's not a dick, it's a microphone. Put it in front of your mouth. It's the Voiceland motto. How's everybody doing tonight? Good. Doing good? Yeah. Excellent. Welcome to Wasteland 23. I never thought I'd do three of these, much less 23 of these. And you know what? I'm still not getting rich. <laughs> so if you just want to put money in a jar and donate it, I'll take it. You should do some photo ops. Oh, yeah, that's what we need. $60 blurry photo ops. Yeah, that's so fucking wasteland. Yeah. It's like those $50 and $60 autographs. That's so fucking wasteland. You know, yeah, I'd rather go broke than do that shit to you guys. Yeah. We, are, we are the last of the old school fan shows. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're welcome. You know, you're applauding yourself here for being here because honestly, I can't fucking stand those shows. Okay, Christ, they make my skin crawl. How do you feel about Horror Hound, Ken? Well, I do not talk about other shows. We call them other shows. We don't mention them by name, we just don't like them. The skin crawl shows. The people who aren't fans. There's no greed here. Honestly, if there was greed, we'd charge more. And, and not refund you. And be really rude. And make you stand in the line. And all kinds of other shit. And there'd definitely be no free drinks. The Wasteland regulars know there's a lot of free drinks. Oh, yeah, free drink. <laughs> Not right now. Oh, I have yeah. to do my first panel tonight. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> you guys want free drinks? Show up at Gasoline Night at the Movies tomorrow night. Plenty of free drinks at a Gasoline Night at the Movies. And a lot of crap to give away. I see the flyer for the next show? October. First ever Hills Have Eyes reunion. Oh. Um, you know what I say? If somebody else has done it, I have no interest in doing it. But as long as I do it first, anyone else can do it after. And they have. Oh, I don't care. You're allowed to copy. It's flattering. It's not copying. Hey, remember, can you have a little bit of sugar here in the monster bash? That's fine. There's nothing wrong with copying. I just like to be first. I'm the kind of guy who, I, I can't understand, I run a goddamn business, I go do these shows as a dealer, and I still have time to hunt up guests that have never done a show, yet everyone else, every show I do, I see the same guest list again. You don't have to like our guest list, show up and learn something, damn it. Spend about five hours on IMDB and Wikipedia and learn something. Yeah, that's what Before I'm you come to this show, and come to this show, meet somebody and learn something, that's what we're about. Or go we see don't the... like no learning. Yeah, well, we do like learning. <laughs> yeah. I don't like running the same generic thing. That's what I don't like. Yeah. Make it funny, Ken. Huh? Make it funny. Make it funny. Ladies and gentlemen, the first panel of the night. You guys sit in the middle. We sandwich between two fat guys this way. He's directing. <laughs> Lieberman's directing his cast. Director gets the best billing. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> you know, we can turn that up. Hey, hey, give us no, black. That's great. It's a great idea. <laughs> Thank you. How's my lighting? You're good. See that? Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, my. Yeah, it works. Hello? This works. Sure work. Yours is working. It is. It is. It is. Mm-hmm. Uh, can't not okay, thank you work. Work. Uh, <laughs> hey, I'm not falling for that shit. <laughs> Jesus Christ! You know what happens when you're eight man's man a drunk? This is what happens. Damn it, Gasly! Here, you use mine. I'll shoot. I'm on this one now. I think they're trying to fuck with me. What's wrong with that? I'm on five. Look, oh, no. Abby. No. Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> I know, I can't so I good mic to somebody riveting. else. I'm yeah, this is a riveting panel. That's the one word descriptor I think that best fits. Yeah, you riveting. Know, you, you, know, you know, we're so low key, we don't even care if the mics work. Look, I'm. Damn you. That's what you get when you hire drunks as a Navy guy. Oh, oh wait, I didn't hire him, he works for free. All right, please start this panel. Welcome to Cinema Wasteland 23. So. We have with us the esteemed director, Jeff Lieberman. Thank you. Jamie Rose and Grace Lieberman. From Just Before Dawn. A film that holds up so, so well and is near and dear to all of our. Not so, so. So, so isn't so very, very well. So, so. <laughs> it's a great film. Actually, it holds up very well. I love the fact that I'm here really with well. two horror people and they're doing shtick. It's like Abbott and Costello. <laughs> you know? I don't know. We don't take ourselves very seriously here at Wasteland. We don't actually care if this panel completely bombs. We, I care. Oh, wait, no. I, I, we're going to guess, actually. Dude. I think we can turn this around. Let's turn this around. We can. We so, can do this. We've done this before. We're well practiced. Jeff Lieberman. Tell us about the genesis of Just Before Dawn. Uh, the original screenplay was called um, The Last Ritual, and some Czechoslovakian uh, producer, who was a pretty classy producer, he did uh, Closely Watched Trains and uh, some others, and uh, he called, I was working at Janice Films at the time, and he calls me up, and he says, So, is this the Jeff Lieberman? I said, yeah, he says, so you'll come and do for us? Which you, you did, oh, you do, did the squirms? I said, yes. He says, so you'll come and do for us, yes? That was it. And uh, I said, do what? Oh, the movie thing. We got the Linda Blair. We got the George Kennedy. And you'll come. That was the pitch. And, uh, I went up to his office, and basically they gave me a script that was, it was, um, I can't even say it was a screenplay, it had pictures in it, it had <laughs> the pictures, not storyboard, it was like comic book and art, and uh, so I said I'll do it, I had this deliverance thing, so no matter what this was, I'm going to turn it into deliverance with a chick, you know, instead of John Boyd. No matter what it said. So they said, okay, but keep the characters' names the same because they already pre sold the movie. So as long, you know, they're not going to actually read it, it's. They... Oh. 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 oh, yeah, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Some yeah, guys. you know, the comic stylings of my AV guy. <laughs> Hello? There we go. I don't know. All right. And that's pretty much it. Oh, it. And, uh, <laughs> so, if it's not broke, don't fix it. <laughs> you, um, now you're not, uh, to put it lightly, you're not a religious person. I think that we can we can say that. And the, the script was a very um, religious script, correct? A very religiously themed project. Yeah, it was called The Last uh, Ritual, and it was about a snake ritual in the Ozark Mountains where something with snakes, and they get married, and hillbillies, and so the first thing I did is take all of that out, all of it. Um, not only am I an atheist, but I'm not into, like, snake rituals, so it's a, it's a no-brainer. So I took all that out, but I kept the names Connie and... Megan, all that, and uh, look, they, they pre-sold the movie based on me directing it, so they really didn't have any choice. 
What's your name? Daniel. What's his name? Is he gonna remember? What's his name? Jonathan. 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 I'm not even gonna tell you. I want the audience to tell you. Jonathan. After the movie, I'm sure. Jonathan. How did you get involved with the project, Chris? Uh, he hired me. Oh, did uh, Jeff want to film here? Yeah, he said, he said you want to do a film? I said, sure. <laughs> it had to be a little bit more. Did you audition? Early initially? in your career. Did you read for him? Did you, you know, dance for him? Well, honestly, <laughs> if, 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 if memory serves me correctly, the film was somewhere in the 80s, and um, uh, I, I really don't remember yeah, kind of like anything about that. Yeah. 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 That's, that's, that's pretty much just the whole 80s. It was just a big wash for me. Um, so I'm not quite sure what the hell I did, but either way, the next thing I knew, I was in Silver Lake Forest with, uh, with this guy and, and this gal, and we had a ball. Yeah. True. Yeah. How about you? Jamie, you have to get involved. Okay, so here is now. <laughs> um, I auditioned, and Jeff and I had instant comic chemistry, and I told them a joke, and I remember the joke. Did you hear the one about the jump rope and the lollipop? No, I didn't. What? Skip it, it sucks. <laughs> you got the part. And then, got the and then I told some other joke, I can't remember. And we just loved each other. But the producers didn't think I was hot enough. So I had to take hot pictures of myself. And to let you know what a sick family I'm from, my mother shot the pictures. <laughs> And I had this little, like, terry club. I mean, redheads, I mean, I'm a natural redhead, so not so hot, especially because my hair is naturally really curly, like you see in the movie, it was before gel. And so it was just like, frizzy red hair. And I had a pink, not the definition of hot. And so, you know, I'm like, oh, I'm hot. Like, my mother's like, good, honey, good. Look at the So, yeah, and I remember I had to give you these pictures, and I, I don't know. They, they okayed it. <laughs> he told me that they were he, that I was like he was trying to not go for the cliche, meaning not the hot girl. <laughs> like, I, was trying, I cast the girl who's not hot. Hold on a second. I actually, and that's for you. If, if memory serves me correctly, you actually beat out Daryl Hannah for that part. Did I really? Yeah. No, here's another trivia. His manager at the time. It's a guy named Chuck Bender, who's a huge manager in Atlanta. He handled Sharon Stone, Daryl Hannah, yeah, yeah, like still does. He's yeah, huge. You know, and at that yeah. time, he That's was like, hey, was... it's my... <laughs> so at that time, he was like managing a couple people. I don't let him. We talk and, a lot. Shit. All right, hold on. So, just wait. So, he, so Chuck Bender comes to the, the set, and we were all like, I'm sorry, we were all loaded the whole time. And we had like a card game in my room or something. Okay, I go to sleep, or I pass out, rather, and at 3 o'clock in the morning I wake up, there's a friggin' man in my room! Chuck Bender is sitting in a chair in my room! The maid let him in! This is a good manager. The maid, he convinced the maid to let him in my room. That, that's the yeah, yeah, whole story. I told him to I, get out, but I mean... He was bucking for a client. He was he, bucking for a client by getting, breaking into a room at 3 o'clock in the did morning he while he was passed out. Did he represent <laughs> Sandwich. He did. He did. No, he totally did. Yeah. Yes. Yes. We yeah. call that a stalker today. Yeah. Yes. Yes. What did I you How did he get in the room? I, I can't. Wait. I'm just I was watching. I'm 20 years old. I'm just no, watching. Take, take this. this guy 19 gets, or 20. This guy gets classier. When I was still casting, <laughs> at the end of the casting day, and I hadn't cast Debbie Benson's, you know, right. Lee room. And I'm, you know, uh, what's your name? Um, Daryl. Katie? No, no. The one from... <laughs> What's the key to comedy, Jeff? Timing. No, but I can't remember. Watch my name. Okay, it rhymes like with um, Scarface. She was Al Pacino. Oh, no, like Michelle no, Pfeiffer. No, Michelle Pfeiffer came up, and I, I was considering her and Debbie Benson. And oh. I liked Debbie. And then, about five o'clock, days over, this bimbo comes in, who's so wrong with fake, you know, like. She looked like a hooker. You know what? She was a hooker. <laughs> Looks like a hooker, smells like a hooker. Like a sent her, Scott's on her, sent her like Vig to, to hire Debbie. 
It was told like Fanny. What, like Vig, what? You know, Vig, like, um, what's Vig? Uh, oh, to get you to hide? Yeah. yeah. Like, I see. Now, like that's a, a good manager. <laughs> <laughs> this is how you do it. I would sent you a hooker so you'd hire the other one. You know? And so I was going to hire anyway. Which I did. <laughs> but he came down, I kept him off the set. Right? I'm still there. Do you know he still represents me? He, he does? does? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. Really? Yeah. That one will have more. How's he doing? Yeah, so yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so what we should be talking about Sorry. is the lake scene. And this yeah. young lady. Talk about your new yeah. scene, yeah. Jamie. Yeah. The lake scene. The lake scene. Like, a lot of locals on the that. Lake like, scene. A lot of went bystanders. Down. I said, her. listen, she's doing nudity. So, <laughs> I, there really was a park range. You know, like George Kennedy. It was a real park. park. It, it was, was a national real, park. Yeah. Wow. And the guy, he lived there and his family, like, in the middle of the thing. And I said, look. We're having this scene tomorrow, and there's going to be nudity, so please can close off. Because the lake that you see with the waterfall, there's a walkway all the way around for the public, you know? Oh, like, no. We're closing Yosemite. So yeah. I... Like, so you can't go to a public park. Yeah. Being the naive, <laughs> naive New Yorker, I actually said to him, so are you cool with that? He's like, oh, no, no, you know. He told the church, he told everybody <laughs> they're doing nudity in the, in the lake. I get there, I say, okay, Jane, we're going to do this sweet. thing. And I look Maybe. up, there's like a hundred people. So I, so I had to say, like, okay, my job as a director is to get her to know, like, oh, look at that fish. Like, keep looking down. Please yeah. don't look at all the locals on the lake. I tell you, folks, they really were. They were literally lined up. I had no idea. Binoculars, they had telescopes. I had no idea. Like a modern day All I knew, though, so, is that there was like sewage in that freaking lake, and it was so cold. Yeah. It was. Uh, it was cold sewage. It was, it was pretty it was brutal. Disgusting. And she was great because there was one scene where after, you know, uh, oh, wait, a hunter. I got a good thing to tell, too, when you were good. I'm not going to get it. I'm going to wear an edgewise tonight. It's amazing. I'd forgotten about Rose. Uh, you know, she had to go running across the rocks. You saw that. You, know, you remember, the, for those guys who have seen the film, she goes running across the rocks. And this, she gave everything. She was 110%. She gave it all. There she was, bouncy, bouncy along the rocks. You know, with all these people standing going, she ain't wearing no top. Look at the fish. Yeah, look at that thing go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it was my very first scream kiss. So again, I gave everything. <laughs> so, so, I you remember watched that. the movie. I remember. I that. thought, okay. <laughs> and just like tongue, tongue the whole tongue going tongue across the screen. Tongue. It goes into his mouth. So, I didn't learn, you know. It's in movies, you want it to look pretty. You just want to. Yeah, it's it was like it's tongue. Different. I don't know. I was oh, a train. Well, that's what everything is all about. I mean, thank God the water was cold. What can I say? <laughs> oh, and here's a, a little... A little anecdote that um, George Kennedy. Oh, uh, I was going to say, yeah. please tell the story about in, George Kennedy and the horse. In his yeah. contract, because so I figured, you know, it's George Kennedy's and Westerns, you know, these guys that pull up and, you know, and uh, he could ride, but in his contract, I find that on the location, I can't film him getting on or getting off the horse. <laughs> it's like, what? What the hell? This guy's like, man. It's yeah. Western. <laughs> what the hell would you want that shot for anyway? Well, I mean, you know, mounting up. What do you mean? That's mounting. You know, I'm out of here and they mount up. You know, it's like weird. And he does get off the horse when he shoots the guy. I mean, he's supposed to. So uh, my AD said to me, uh, he told me this. I said, what kind of shit? I said, well, when's he get, get on the horse? I want to see what they're talking about. Like, why is this? Because I can shoot around him. So Freddie tells me that Teamsters are, you know, they have Teamsters for the horses. And they're way off. They had that work light. They were way off to the side in the woods. I'm sneaking over there and I see two guys. The horse is going around the circle and George's stomach is on the saddle. And the horse is just going around and going around in circles until he finally got on. They had one, each guy had one ankle. Get on. George stayed on the horse the whole night. 
He never got off. He's, he's, he stayed on the horse for pretty much the entire shoot. The whole, yeah, the whole shoot. He was still on the horse. He was, he was working. He was working for a week, and, and he never got off the horse. The whole horse. Just rode around in circles. Yeah, on his stomach. But the thing, thing, I found this funny as hell when Jeff told me it's because the guy could not get on and off a horse, but, but he, he could not ride. But he could ride like a son of a bitch. He but he couldn't. Like, Why didn't you just get him a damn ladder? <laughs> yeah, that was uh, funny. So, so, so Jeff, you were um, in your early 30s directing 31. this 31, directing this very young cast. How hard were they to control? How bad they behaved? The hardest, they? most impossible. It was like camp. And I was the counselor. <laughs> serious. Especially considering you kept changing the script. And I'm cha oh, that's not. I was changing that script while I was shooting. I was going like, can I change the? You know, I got this great idea. It wasn't in the script where they, where every time one of the mountain guys kills somebody, takes an article of clothing because I thought that's like, an you know, an animal pelt type thing. They don't know the difference. But can I do that? I'm already shooting, and it's like, boom. Mm -hmm. So I was winging it on the, and these guys were like, what was it, hot rods to hell. They were having just a giant <laughs> party. One time I sent them, they showed up, they had no white in their eyes, it was all red. And I sent them all home. I said, it's true. Yeah, all five guys. I, remember sitting I had to shoot trees that day, squad He sent us home from school. I reprimanded you. Yeah, but then we went out on the weekend and did Hot Rods to Hell Part 2 with big you. Boy. <laughs> That's the no fun at all. <laughs> Here we are, thirty something years later. Uh, we must have done something. Right. It was a uh, pretty perilous shoot. Uh, there were definitely a lot of scary stunts. And uh, Chris, did you feel uh, at at risk at certain points during the the filming? Well, again, this was the 80s, and, uh, you know, my, my sense of recall from that whole era is, is a little fuzzy, but... Uh, no, it was... Um, actually, it was really very exciting. I think the, the, the biggie for us was, was hanging off the, the side of the waterfall, wasn't it? Yeah, well, you... Everybody said you have to wear a harness, and the waterfall was like, from here to that light, boom, down, dead. It was real. So... He says, no, I'm going to do it without, I'm going to hold on to this rope without the harness. And all I'm thinking is, what scenes don't we need with him? <laughs> I, have to, I have to, I love you, but I have to think, bottom line, like bottom line, he goes over, do you still have a movie or not? And he insisted, he's holding on to that rope, right? I mean, yeah. insane. Because it really was a death thing. <laughs> yeah. But it, it looked great. Right. Yeah, it was great fun. And, you know, and we really did. I mean, we, we joke and stuff, but we really did have a great working rapport. And, and Jeff always gave us the confidence in the room to, you know, to play around a little bit. One of my favorite uh, moments uh, is when I first see John Hunsaker, who's the fellow who played... I can't believe I can remember his name. Tim? Many years you can't remember his name. Holy <laughs> shit. Uh, but when I first see Hunsaker, I, I, I look up and there he is. And, 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 you know, and it was, you know, I wanted to add a little line, which Jeff, you know, kept in, which was, hi, are you from around here? <laughs> or what's it, this right neighborhood? No, you said you're from around here. You feel like, 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 like you made him in a drugstore. Right, right. Hey, hey, you doing? Well, yeah. you know, so it was, it was a wonderful experience, and I think that really kind of crossed over to, to every... Who said that? Yeah, you know, don't be me. Uh, are, are you half drunk? Oh, you got to pay our airplanes. Are you kidding me? I'm getting laughs. You're gonna be getting this all night long, bro. my finger. Stop. You're man. gonna get this all night long, and you're gonna love it. Um, you know, you gotta. We, we had a blast together, and I think a lot of that shows in, in the film. And, it, and when you have that kind of camaraderie on a project, and it doesn't happen very often, uh, you, you always end, it always ends up, ends up being very beneficial to the project. So. Well, a lot, of, a lot of times too, like when you think about how young you were, it was one of your first films, first first major role, anyway. Th those are, you know, you took chances and, and you wanted to do well, and, and you have great memories of it. Then, as you go through the system, it, it changes. And we hear it a lot from people up on this stage that, you know, as it goes along, it's cut and dry. I do my scenes, they yell cut, I walk off. But so sometimes it's actually those films that were the first things you ever did that are the ones where you, you look back now and go, why the hell did I do that? 
Well, as, as they say, once you've done a film, it's pretty much indelible. Uh, you know, it's, it reminds me of a famous story of my father and Walter. He did a film, my pop did a film that, that just sucked. And, uh, and he brought Walter along as a security blanket. And That's Walter Matthau. Walter Matthau. Yeah, Walter Jack Lemmon. Jack Lemmon. Jack Lemmon. Walter Matthau. Jack and Matt. I knew a much better Jack Lemmon what, than him. What film I knew a better that? Walter Matthau, too. I wake up in the morning, there's little notes on my pillow. Say we're out of cornflakes. F you. Give me three hours to figure out that F you meant Felix Hunger. What? What did they do with son? He said, yeah, so he brought him along to the screening, and he's sitting there holding the film. And finally, the thing, the movie's over. It was awful. And, he, and my father turns to his dad. He says, so, so, so what you think? Matt that turns to him without a beat and says, get out of it. <laughs> what film was it? Yeah. You remember the film? I'm telling. Oh, come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Your dad and Walter did grown the old man, man. You can tell it was uh, Alex and the Gypsy. Okay. Okay. That wow. wasn't a bad Enough said. Oh. Enough said. Who the hell has heard of Alex and the Gypsy? I, I, I don't know. Us old no. guys? I am. No. No. Stop it. That's I am. You're the one. I know, I know people. <laughs> so Just Before Dawn holds up very, very well. And one of the reasons, one of the many reasons it holds up so well is its use of music. You use silence a lot. And then the original score isn't overbearing. And, and when you do have pop music, you ended up with a number one hit song in the movie somehow, which is very strange for a low, low budget movie. You know, that's really weird, that blonde hair thing. I don't know how they swung it money-wise. I just said, you know, I, I didn't specifically pick that up. But, I, uh, cause I don't think it was a hit song when you got it. Oh, yeah, it was. It was a hit song yeah, when then you got it. Yeah. It, it, well, it, it's a, it was a pretty non-commercial move to have so much silence in the movie. To have well, it so you see, Brad Fidel, he, this is my pat on the back. Watch out, you're get mad Brad, Brad had only, he was the rhythm guitar for Hall and Oates, and he really didn't do any movies, and I just, we hit it off, he got what I wanted, which was the opposite of a horror movie. I don't like when the movie music tells you, be scared now, you're going to get scared, and you're getting more scared. So I said, let's do the opposite of that. Like, every time there's a, what they do now with electron and they go boom, 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 you know? You, we have crickets, like nothing. So it's either going to work or it's not. But I said the most scary thing, if the content, if you don't believe in the content, then you suck. You don't have, you, you're, you can't make it scary by scaring people in, uh, with music. For instance, if you take a Woody Allen movie, Right? And I don't, any scene in the Woody Allen movie, if suddenly you hear this big blast of music, everybody's going to jump. Right? Because it's going to scare you, it's going to startle you. That has nothing to do with content. So, I mean, I got a lot of resistance from the producers because Friday the 13th just came out while I was still editing. And it was like, make this, the same guy with the squirms. Make the 150 million. Make the 150 million. And, you know, and Brad and I are doing like, okay, I want to hear cicadas. And then, you know, this is in real life. You go in the woods and you hear cicadas. The scariest noises in the world is when they stop. When they stop. Yep, that's yeah. Fuck. That's it's a bear. It's a There's thing. There's something coming. This is a level that, <laughs> like, that. I never did. I just felt that's the way to do it. Now everybody says it's great. Brad Fidel is Brad Fidel. But at that time, that's my path. And uh, he showed the movie, uh, James Cameron saw the movie and hired him for Terminator. Yep. So what could be bad? <laughs> so what could be bad? <laughs> <laughs> what? Brad did all the Terminators, he did truly did everything. But just before Don's better. I, I agree. <laughs> It's a great film. Not, not quite as good as Chopper Chicks in Zombie Town. <laughs> or Weekend Warriors. Sorry, that's my suck up because I'm sitting next to Chopper. And I just did the Weekend Warriors to all the balance it up. I love Blue Sunshine. Blue Sunshine. I love Sam's Little Helpers. I believe that. Anybody else? Before we open up to the audience, there's going to be um, the whole room, we're going to have a dance party now to relive the fire scene, right? Uh, uh, <laughs> and Brad did that music and that yeah. that's his voice. Uh, 
this. What is this? After this is over, we are going to reenact the, the fire scene in, in the other room. And you are going to all go visit their tables immediately after this is over. Um, not to keep talking about the music, but one more question about the music, because it is very interesting. There's a very small amount of stock music in it, like um, like Ross Gaffney-esque like stock horror cue music. Um, was that... Your decision, or was that done? Uh, and Brad, Brad had nothing to do with that, and I had nothing I so. to do with that. That was after my cut of the movie. Um, this Vlado guy, no, my director's cut. The producer, this Vlado guy, brought in somebody else, Victor Konevsky. It wasn't his fault, and he put in those trying to corny it up with those. I never even saw it, Brad. I hadn't spoken to Brad since as long as you and I. Um, I spoke to him like a year ago, trying to help my daughter with something. It was couldn't have been great, more gracious. And he saw the movie, and uh, you know the thing that you did, the comedy uh, documentary that came with the DVD. Yeah. Yeah. How did you not know this DVD? I didn't know. Is this a private? Oh, 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 so anyway. Yes. Yeah. I didn't even know I did one for this one. You're on camera, man. You're on, it's an on-screen interview. I don't remember any of that. So, so, when did I do that? In the late 90s, a long time ago. But Brad saw the movie. The 90s are all gone, too. Yeah, it was great. Brad That's when I was working with, with Hulk. Oh, and yeah. forget that, it's all gone. It's all gone. Anyway, Brad yeah. saw the DVD and, and I saw that music for the first time. Well... Yeah. One of the other things about Just Before Dawn, there's hardcore Just Before Dawn fans know that there's 16 millimeter prints with alternate scenes. There's all sorts of mythology about things that were shot. There are things, scenes that are out there that people haven't seen. Um, are we going to be seeing any of that in the future? And what, if anything, was cut from the movie that we should know about? I think that there's no like great shakes. They, they make a big deal about the missing footage. It's just more of... It's more character, basically. It's more longer scenes, more character. It's not like this, oh, there's this cool scene where somebody gets Yeah, there's a graphic no scene missing. you're missing. I'll be doing the behind the scenes for, for that one as well. <laughs> but why the different, right? Who edited the longer version? I mean, why the different version? I this time. The longer version was my director's cut. The shorter version was this guy, Victor Konensky, which I had no control over because I yeah. didn't have a so, But how did your director's cut end up like surfacing in 16 millimeter format? It's me. Well, a lot of times that happens. As a 16 mil film collector, um, a lot of times the original cut winds up in a collector market, and 16 was very popular before the age of video as a collector market, so they put out the longest version mostly because that was the version that they had the negatives for, and then the producers a lot of times recut it for theatrical, so... Um, there's a number of films out where the longest version you could find is... Like Dawn of the Dead, of course. Was Dawn like of the one Dead of the is, one, is, is a prime example. There was a 16 mil is the longer version. Um, just Before Dawn is the longer version. The Horror at Party Beach is the longer version. But what they didn't tamper with the collector market, but the theatrical market, the producers would go and trim it down um, for any number of reasons. So, the, so a lot of times the collector market was the most uncut. I know that. Or because no, we all know that, but a lot of times you know it's it's easier to trace how that ended up out there. I mean, the director's cut yeah. it just before dawn. Well, so. well, just yeah. just print was just print. Here it is, and then they struck collector market prints off that because sixteen was big, and then they went, well, now it's theatrical. I don't like this, so they cut it out. Pretty fucking interesting. Well, there you go. Speaking, speaking of interesting, speaking of interesting uh, not to digress from just before dawn too much, but Jeff just re released Remote Control. Uh, and it's the first time it's been available in a long, long time. Do you want to talk about the process of self releasing Remote Control? Yeah, it's just I've been looking for elements for more than 10 years. Track down the original producer, track down the. Uh, Karolko Pictures, the last people that had it. Everybody said, I wish I could help you. We have no idea. Uh, it's banks. It's, you know, banks own it because of the whole library is owned by banks, including that picture. So, I couldn't find any elements, and I saw it was screened in a film festival in Paris, and I just sent an email, and bang, the guy's got a 35 millimeter pristine print in English, no subtitles, so... I uh, 
took out my checkbook and <laughs> spent like, I don't know, a lot, like 10 grand, and uh, shipped it over, had a 2K uh, trans. I did everything that a studio does, including the commentary, the authoring, still gallery, and it looks as good as it could. It's, it's really good. So. And one of the first places you can get it is right here. That's in the right way. Here. Directly right from <laughs> Jeff Lieberman. Signed in number. What I did was I made a thousand DVDs and a thousand Blu-rays. After that, that's it. I'm not making any more. Yeah, yeah. Sure, then they'll go on eBay for like $200. <laughs> yeah, I'm not milking it forever, guys. If you want one, grab that's it. Now. I'd like to go off the subject of Just Before Dawn and because it's one of my favorite campy 80s films, talk to Jamie about. Honestly, Chopper Chicks in Zombie Town, which was like one of her 80s lead roles. And But the funny thing about it is you actually, it was a super early role for, for Billy Bob Thornton, too. Yep. Who here has seen Chopper Chicks? Uh, wow! It's Wasteland, dude. Eh? <laughs> Isn't it terrible? <laughs> yeah, but it's so, it's so terrible. Okay, so this movie was supposed to be a comedy spoof of a zombie... Slash motorcycle movie. Like the you know? zombie genre. But <laughs> the director, bless his heart, uh, was, was a really good writer. The script was actually very funny, but he couldn't direct. And he had these incredibly strong women on bikes, and he just, like, lost control of the ship the first day. So we basically directed it. I mean, like, Close up, right here. <laughs> like, you know, he just—he really knew what he was doing. So the film kind of lost its way, um, and I think it's a little bit reflected in the movie. Well, There's some great little it, moments, it, but it meanders a bit. Yeah, but, 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 but Billy Bob, it was very first role, it and first I had I had I had Billy above him, Don and he was Don Calvin was in it, but Billy Bob Thornton was his very first film role, and he. Uh, <clears throat> <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and he, we, he, he really did talk a lot by it. And he kind of was unattractive. You know, the chopper cheeks were, were like, oh my God, I can't believe you have to make out with that guy. And I was like, I know, he's so gross. He's like, oh. <laughs> I think I, I think I learned how to do the tongue. But we did like, like a whole make out. But he was really nice. He was a really nice guy. Um, but here's, a, so the thing is, we all did our own writing. And I was actually second choice originally, they, they'd given it to this uh, actress, I forgot her name, but it turned out she was pregnant and hadn't told them and they were freaked out because they thought, you know, she might have an accident on the bike and lose the kid. So they got rid of her and they offered it to me, but all the other chopper chicks had been training on the motorcycles for like five weeks. And I, would, and I said, oh, it's not a problem. I can ride a, motor I can ride a horse. So a motorcycle... <laughs> Same thing. <laughs> oh, absolutely. You, you, you well, a horse, some grass and all things. A horse has a certain investment in remaining upright that a motorcycle does not have. And I learned this so fast. And I would fall over. Every time I stopped the bike, I would fall over. And they would... And, and, and they, the crew started placing bets on how many times a day I, I dropped the bike. The other chopper chicks... Didn't like to park next to me because of the potential <laughs> domino effect. <opinion. laughs> yeah, it was terrifying. And if you watch the movie, there's a couple scenes like when, the night that I stay with Billy Bob Thorne, we make out. I, I peel out. Also, I kept stalling the bike because I didn't know how to drive a stick shift. Stick shift. So, so they made like a little like trailer thing, and they like put me on it in the bike, and, and then like rolled it out. <laughs> I imagine yeah. you'd be surprised me and my wife ran a video store for 11 years and it was a very popular rental. It's a great title. That's one, and I think that's what's, that's what's Another fun. bit of horrendous trivia, I don't know if some women knows, know this, but the people who were costumers on this movie uh, formed a company called Chrome Hearts, which later became like Cher's like, go-to company. They're like in Vogue and all that. Their leather jackets are like $10,000. And we, they did our, that was their first thing. They, they are the leather chaps, they did the jackets, and they were just sit on set like putting studs. And I, um, I gave my jacket to my housekeeper like in 1984. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Chrome Hearts, look it up, Google Chrome Hearts, you'll see what an idiot, yeah. Okay, what? Jamie, you're, 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 you? <laughs> Hello. Jamie, you're also in another movie that was distributed by Trauma called Rebel Love. Oh, God. And what do you remember about that Rebel Love that experience? Was just another really horrendous film. <laughs> it's 
a fun movie. Jeff is so bored. No, I'm listening intently. This is He's not allowed to be bored. bored. He had his chance to talk. Yes. Rebel, Lo Rebel Love was was directed by a man named Milton Bagby Jr. from Alabama, and of Milton Bagby's Elevator Company. His parents had made elevators, and he decided he wanted to make a movie like John Ford. And he enlisted the local college kids to be the crew, and uh, he, did, he just made this movie. He hired me and Terrence Knox, and and I I was playing Civil War. I had so much eye makeup. <laughs> Civil War 80s eye makeup. Yeah. And yeah, it was so, yeah, and it's. Civil War 80s eye makeup. Yeah, it was like so full on 80s eye makeup. So like, hey, I need more eye makeup. Uh, yeah, it was, yeah, it's, what can I say? Well, Kathy, Kathy Lee Lee Lee. Lee. Chris was in a ton of, ton of, ton of, ton of TV and movies. And um, one of the movies you were in that was a lot of fun was Weekend Warriors. Yeah. Hello? Hello? We've got to get these people laughing. Two Irish guys walk out of a bar. Hey, can I? That's, that's actually a funny joke. Uh, yeah, yeah, Bert Convy, great guy, um, passed away shortly after <laughs> He did. But he did a number of things. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was, it was fun. It was, you know, it was Lloyd Bridges. I mean, Lloyd Bridges is just, you know, he's the best. I mean, he's the best guy. You, you walk in, you know, you, you, you start a scene and, and you're, you, you look across the table and you go, holy shit, I'm acting with Lloyd Bridges. You know, I mean, the guy's iconic, you know. And, uh, so it was, um, it was, you know, it was film, but who cares? Uh, it, was, it was a wonderful experience. Yeah. yeah. Same with Swing Shift. I'll tell you a great Swing Shift story. Um, I was only in it. Don't blink your eyes. But uh, it was me and Christine Lottie and Goldie and Kurt. And Goldie and Kurt met on, on Swing Shift. And John Demi was directing. And Demi had a one-day shoot. So had a, a very yeah, good budget. Got a hold of this certain way. And uh, <laughs> he also had a very good budget. And he decided to, it was a big scene, and it took him five days to shoot it. Now, during that five days, basically, the four of us are sitting at a table staring at each other. And Goldie and Kurt, two of the nicest people you want to meet, by the way, um, you know, at first they're just congenial across the table. And slowly but surely, as the week wore on, the chairs got closer and closer and closer and closer. And then it was just the two of them like this, you know, like this. And, you know, I, you know I'm looking at Christine, who is, can be a little frigid. And Christine's, you know, it's like, <laughs> and so finally, Demi gets ready to shoot on a Friday. Goldie and Kurt are gone. They were all in the trailer. They had nowhere to be found. And that's, 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 that's where they fell in love. We sat there and watched them fall in love. Isn't that a cute story? Yeah. 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 You also had a fun little role in. Uh, we talked about it a little bit earlier in. Uh, Happy Hooker Goes Hollywood, which <laughs> starred Martin Beswick yeah. is the, is in, the, in the role. I, I, for some Holland. reason, during that 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 like you know that decade that I, that I can't remember anymore, which is probably a good thing. Um, I, I got into like a few naughty little films like that. That one and What's COD. And, but there was actually a couple of good ones too. There was one called Lena's Holiday that I'm really quite proud of. That probably nobody has ever seen. But it's uh, you know if you ever get a chance to see it, it's actually a pretty good little film. We shot it for five hundred thousand bucks. Which um, you know back then was really really hard to do because you didn't have three chip cameras and MacBook Pros and Final Cut. Um, so uh, yeah, it was it was an interesting interesting. You've also done a ton of TV and you worked with uh, I mean like uh, we were talking about Thunder and Paradise with Hulk Hogan, <laughs> which which surprisingly lasted several seasons. Yeah, we did three years on that show. Uh, Terry was Terry was my he, and still is but, you know like a big brother to me. Well, big brother is six months older than me. Um, he, I, I just, you know, he's he's a true, truly one of my best friends. I had a fabulous time with him. He's a great guy, and it's one of those kind of sad things that happens in this business. I mean, because you know, we were on the beach every day, driving fast boats and sporty cars and shooting guns and babes everywhere. And then afterward, and we really became very close friends. Afterwards, you try to get together, and it's just like, what the fuck are we doing? You know, what, do you want to have sushi? Yeah, now what? You know, you know, it's, we don't get to go up and blow up any, any cartels or anything. And sadly, no explosions. You can never, you can never reach that level of, of just true excitement that we had as buddies doing that film together. And sadly, it happens a great deal in this business. We kind of split apart. I haven't seen him in many years. I actually think the, the show didn't last the seasons because the, the camaraderie. I mean, like, it was... 
I remember clicking it on, you know, yeah. watching it. It was actually also, I mean, you know, it was what it was, but it was an extremely well produced uh, show. They had a million bucks an episode, a little over a million an episode, which is wow. a very, very healthy budget. Yeah. Especially for uh, the time. Yeah. And, and we shot it at Disney World. So everything we needed was given to us for free. We we just go to Epcot Center. We could be in any country we wanted every week, mm -hmm. and it was all free. So all that million bucks, you know, showed up in the production. Now, I, and I'll say this, and I do say it, and it is the truth. Uh, sadly, I wish I could say all of that money went on the screen, but it didn't. A lot of that money went into the producers' pockets, and and the uh, uh, the execs uh, said, "Stop it." And the producers were very greedy, and they didn't. And that's the reason the show got canceled. Otherwise, we would have gotten a six or seven year run out. Yeah, I thought it was kind of funny because it, it reminded me of the old Baywatch good. episodes. It was it was fun. Well, same producers, I mean, guilty pleasure. Uh, same producers, mm -hmm. but that's the reason the show went off the air. It's it's just you know it kills me to this day. But that it happens in this business all the time, and uh, it's just too bad. Because I'll tell you, man, I had a ball with him. Anyways, I'm talking too much. Leave him and say something. Oh, you never talk too much. How about, how about the audience? You guys got a, a question for anyone of the cast? Good, man. Yeah, I got one for Chris. Um, your very first credit here, Airport 77. Can you tell me and the audience anything about your <laughs> wonderful stories about working with Gil Gerard, Christopher Lee, your dad, and... Well, it was, uh, again, I, I showed up to say hi to Pop when they were shooting down in San Diego, and, he, and the son of a bitch goes over <laughs> to the director and says... Why don't you put Ram in the in the in the the scenes? He's probably gonna stink. Let me tell you something. The kid stinks. He's not. He's a rotten kid. But you know, he might be back here. So the so the director pulls me aside and says, "Here, we're gonna give you this radio control man thing." And I literally look around. Here's Chris Lee and all these guys stand, you know, stand around. Jimmy Stewart was on the set. Thing. I'm looking at Jeremy uh, 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 Jimmy, Jimmy Stewart in and, and, and the corners so watching watching me act, saying, he's, Jack, he's got a lot to learn. <laughs> and they stick me in there. I've never so fucking nervous in my life. If, if you know, if you see see me in this, you think you can see I'm just, you know, I'm gone. But that's where I got my SAG card, and that was uh, that was the one and only time my old man helped me in the business. Uh, yeah. So God bless him. Love you, Pop. Yeah. Um, Jeff, for, yeah. for Squirm, how many worms were imported during filming? How many worms were imported from Squirm? Uh, you know, we didn't have like a worm calculator. But, <laughs> you know, and if I just oh, simply God, said a shitload, you know, what is a shitload? <laughs> well, I would say 25. Five days of shitloads because we shot for 25 days. So in those 25 days, they came in uh, from everywhere, basically, and they were they had to be refrigerated. The worms had to be refrigerated. They get slow, they, yeah. Yeah, they get yeah. So uh, um, we brought them in. How'd you warm them up? What? How'd you warm them up? We warm well. We, you throw them in the sun. What we did was like. I don't know if anybody's seen Squirm, I guess. Yeah, oh, yeah. So, um, what we, we had worm wranglers, and they basically, you know, like I didn't look at each worm, yep, no, 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 you know, I didn't cast the worms. So, uh, they could have been from Brazil, probably. I mean, like, there was no sad card for worms. You know? So, so uh, the, all I knew was like, okay, they come in, they spread them out, and we had a grid of um, copper wire, and it was hooked up to a rheostat. You know, and a rheostat is like the electricity, like Electric. a train transfer. transfer. And then I would say, roll camera, and I'd say, action, zap them, the worms would all jump up. Because they shot them, shot them. Try doing this today with that animal life. Take two. A little less. <laughs> Take three. They replace the worm. Take three. They were like twitch. And then 
the guys would come with snow shovels. Uh, three guys <laughs> stepping out in warm worms. And we did this every day. New, new bag of worms. Now, I, I got to just because we've known each other and talked. Tell us a little bit. When you were doing worm effects, you shot an 8 millimeter roll. Oh, yeah. Film. Yeah. Tell people about this. You know, the, what you got back when you got the 8 millimeter film. Yeah. Well, you know, I sell the, the idea of squirm. And uh, it was a good script. But in my heart of hearts, I said, I gotta be convinced I can make an audience be afraid of worms, right? So I, I knew that, the, that there's worms that bite, you know, I got the saltwater worms, and I had just had a daughter, and she had dolls, so I gouged out the eyes and put as the worms. What, what he was doing was making a test footage, as he was telling you about a mill film here. And I covered the doll with worms. And they were crawling in the eyeballs and all that stuff. So back then, ABL and me, they used to send it to like the drugstore. And then you get it. <laughs> True story. You know, Jack, uh, he remembers me telling him at the time. Uh, I don't so think we ever told it. this. I think yeah. you told it to me on the phone. I get it. Two weeks later, oh, here it is, here it is, I got the projector all set up, my wife is all psyched, it's like, I'm going to watch this, it's be so disgusting, but I know the movie's going to work. I put it on, it's some kid's birthday party. <laughs> <laughs> a kid's birthday or a wedding? No, I think it was a birthday party, and that means... That they have said, so, so, so some kid's birthday <laughs> said there's worms crawling in there. Like the grandparents go right over there. <laughs> Watch this. And I never, I, that might exist today on eBay. So I never saw it. I never saw it. Yeah, please, please don't take your 8 mil films to Walgreens, kids. Yeah. So you don't, you don't have an idea where the worms came from or yeah, the no, what I, types they were? No, I mean, there was. I, I, what they could have been. They were there. <laughs> Yeah, they could be like... <laughs> they dug them up. They you mean called like the species? <laughs> species? that could be like 27... Uh, who knows? Nightcrawlers. All they had to do... Nightcrawlers. They just had to look like worms. They're going to be far away. When we got really close, they had a mouth. Uh, <laughs> and the ones with the mouth, by the way, that scream? You know what that is? That's not a worm scream. No. Worms don't scream. That's a, that's a pig being slaughtered. No! And it's taken from carrots. Because I had the same sound editor, and he said, yeah, "Check this take out." It. And he said, well, he just, he the just take, took the screen. I said, "Sync it up with the mouth." He does. He said, "Boom, works great." Screen in one. Lieberman, Lieberman, take two a little bit less. Maybe the funniest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> take two a little bit less. Yeah. <laughs> a little bit less. less. <laughs> just out of curiosity, at the end of every day or at the end of the shoot, what did you do with the worms if you had that many worms? Put them back to the fridge. No, a lot of, no. Uh, they <laughs> swept them just... off. They swept them off, and I get you, it brings up a... I don't, I don't know if we used all the worms, so I guess they just threw them on the... Uh, out, you know, shoving them out the house. I mean, they, they went of, fishing. They ate a lot of fish happy. Yeah, yeah. a lot of fish happy, or a lot of you know, um, just got rid of them. I, don't know. I mean, we didn't have an official place to bury them, and uh, when we finished shooting, we just they were gone. Got rid of them. <laughs> there were worms. If they were alive, I guess they put them back out into nature. I mean, because they were. Like, that's we what, threw them that's somewhere in the they put them back. That's right why we back had a heart. Nature. Like we, we uh, suddenly said, "Gee, you know, the left was like the Holocaust just happened, right?" So, yeah, but those are the survivors. Let them all go. Weren't there like millions of worms? You just millions. left millions of worms? Yeah. Clearly, the yeah. heads of the Northeast Ohio Worm Association are in the audience, and no one. Okay, I, 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 you know, I always think, I always think, no, here's this true thing. I always think, like, the worm police are in the house, get, be careful. I should get cremated because if they bury me, all the worms go, it's like Hitler. You know what I'm saying? Let's get him! It's like, hey, we finally got our chance, the coffin is made of brass. We don't care. They might make a deal with termite to get through your coffin all those fast minutes. I mean, yeah. Uh, does anyone else have a question? Let's get off the Any other?
Any other, um... Anyone but what about the fish you just before... I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Somebody else got something to say? I, I, I would like to ask Jeff about Blue Sunshine. Ooh. Go ahead. Ask him about Blue Sunshine. There's nothing like Major Don West selling you bad asses. Yeah, it's one of my favorite films, Blue Sunshine. Thank you. Um, and can, you can you tell me about where the inspiration came from that? Did, did you ever actually do any hardcore acid? <laughs> Uh, I'm going to ask you the question. Yeah, did you have any hardcore Are you acid? kidding? Even if, even if I didn't do Blue Sunshine, people would assume I dropped this. I mean, come on. Uh, that's a yes. And, um, and did you have a bad experience that, that caused you to write that film? No, no. Because, because I had a bad experience watching that film. <laughs> Don't try this at home. Yeah, yeah. No, uh... I did, I had, I did LSD, funny enough, I did LSD 25, it was not illegal. It wasn't legal, yeah. it wasn't illegal. It was therapeutic. They were using no. it as a... Yeah, but it, I mean, it wasn't I a controlled... I questioned it, it was just cheap. It, was, it wasn't a controlled <laughs> substance when I did, like I could have gone to a cop and said, watch this, acid, nothing. Right. Did, right? So, that's when I did acid. The next time... I went to the School of Visual Arts and it was like a drug experimental uh, laboratory and everybody wanted mescaline because it's supposed to be natural and shit so I really wanted to do mescaline and finally somebody said, got mescaline and as soon as it kicked in I went, acid because there was no mescaline, nobody had mescaline so I did it twice, once voluntarily, we had a good trip and the other one, like, no, I don't want to do this again and I kind of freaked out so which one which one uh, it, it made, made you uh, write Blue Sunshine? Neither. Uh, the idea of Blue Sunshine was just my idea of the, uh, yeah. like, say, the science fiction movies of the 50s, the fear of radiation was already instilled on the public from the government and from the media, yeah. right? We're so all, We're all of the age where we ducked under our desk. Yeah, duck and cover and, uh, you know, and all like that. Like, that's going to They made everybody crazy, and they had documentaries on TV showing what, um, what the effects, theoretical effects of radiation could be, like rabbits with three eyes, all this stuff. Right. So, what did they do? Hollywood, they made movies of rabbits with three, you know, them and it and Incredible Shrinking Man and all that stuff. The blob. So, I said, wow, this is great. The government is scaring the shit out of a whole generation about what LSD could possibly do. Even though it's bullshit, it's really cool. Like, it's easy to say, ah, the government's full of shit, but that's not fun. What's fun is to say they're right. <laughs> Have you ever heard anyone compare uh, Blue Sunshine to the Big Chill? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> they said it's the Big Chill. I've heard it a lot of times. It it's is. the Big I Chill, like the acid it is. spin. And you know, it's funny that things that happen with Blue Sunshine, that like over the years, um, in no certain order, did you know that uh, Robin Smith and Sever, what's the guy from Susie and the Banshees? Uh, they got together from The Cure, the guy from The Cure and the guy from Susan yeah. yeah, they did, yeah, Steve Shannon, did, and Robert Smith, they did an album called Blue Sunshine, I mean, I have the album jacket in my bathroom, and, uh, and they named it after uh, Blue Sunshine, so they watched a lot of movies. The other thing was the um, disco scene. Now, this is to show the way people write about movies and they just assume stuff afterwards. I'm doing this movie, disco is coming in big. So I'm going to have a, a disco, I built it in Los Angeles. And it has a DJ booth, you know, plexiglass, you know the scene in the Blue Sunshine. So the guy comes in and whatever her character's name, she's, she knows that he's sensitive to noise because of the acid. So she cranks up the music and freaks out. Somebody tells me at CBGB's they're showing Blue Sunshine over and over again on, on TV monitors. Why? It's like a loop. And it was that scene. I went down there and that's what it did. It's the only time I saw the Ramones because they were playing. I wasn't there to see the Ramones. I see it was true. And they did this for weeks. 
Turns out it was my statement that disco sucks because they're the punk group. Now, not true. It could have been country music. It could it could have been rock music. Oh, no, could have disco been, does right? suck. Don't worry. About no, it. Yes, no. But I'm saying they're saying I made a statement that this, but inadvertently I did. I didn't do that intentionally. But I took a bow for it being so cutting edge and punk <laughs> You know, but that's that's the truth. Right? The other that. side, I patted that side. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we hate to keep them more than an hour, and we're we're at our hour. time. Yeah. yeah. So why don't, don't y'all go meet them back? Come to their tables, check out their wares. There's you know, lots more stories to tell, and, and by, by all means, make a meager contribution to their retirement fund. <laughs> we love to have you here. Thank you guys. You're the best fans in the world. Thanks for putting up with us.